Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our negotiations town hall. We are really happy to be here today to be answering questions for you on what's been happening at the negotiating table. As all of you may know, we have committed to being very transparent in this negotiation process, much more transparent than we've ever been here at APFA, and we wanted to keep you up to date on what's being passed at the table um, as soon as we possibly can. We did meet with the company last week and we passed a reserve proposal uh, across the table to the company. That would be our fourth version of it, I believe. And uh, they, they passed scheduling back to us. So we will get into what was passed last week a little later on. Uh, but before we get to that, we want to have Joe Burns, our lead negotiating attorney, talk to you a little bit about the process and a few other items. So Joe, take it away. Uh Afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to say a few words about uh, where we're at in bargaining and kind of what we can expect in the uh, coming months and address a couple other issues. Um, so we're at the point in the negotiations where we're moving to a new phase. Uh, we will be presenting our economic proposal to the company on March 7th. And that will include the three remaining sections of the agreement, which we have not passed to the company, which are mm -hmm. uh, compensation, uh, expenses, and the benefits and retirement section. Uh, the committee has been meeting, looking at uh, you know what's going on with uh, the, the industry economics, uh, other flight attendant agreements where other folks are in negotiations, uh, the survey and you know many other factors to put together uh, economic proposal. We had previously, I think, published a bullet point form of our opening proposal that you all might have seen. Um, we've also been meeting with our you know outside economist uh, Dan Akins, who uh, has a long history of working with uh, AFA and APFA uh, flight attendant unions around the history uh, around the industry. So. Um, so we're going to give that to the to the company and uh, you know we'll be you know asking uh, for you know obviously we're going to be going in there fighting for healthy increases uh, on a wide variety of uh, topics including compensation um, and you know I know the issues come up are we going to propose boarding pay that'll be in there as well um, so um, you know, I think going forward, what what can we expect? Um, you know, I think we can expect that the company's not going to like our proposal, that they're going to have a different conception of uh, where flight attendants are and should be paid. Uh, I don't want to jump the gun, but haven't been through enough negotiations. Uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's uh, pretty predictable wh where we'll be at. Um, so they'll take a while to adjust their, uh, you know, do the analysis of the proposal. Uh, and then we'll, you know, we've got left in negotiations. We've got all the key priorities that uh, weren't okay. resolved prior in negotiations. So items like scheduling rules and hotels and those types of issues. The remaining issues we'll go and fight for along with the uh, compensation issues. Um, we will be, you know, we had published a couple of days ago the, um, in E-Line, which lays out the process under the Railway Labor Act to reach an agreement. Uh, it's been a while since we've had Section 6 uh, negotiations here with all the uh, bankruptcies and mergers and so forth. So it's good to do a refresher if you're new to read up on it. Um, but basically, the process is we're in direct negotiations. That means the union and the company meet together, try and reach an agreement. That's where we are now. Um, the next step is to file for federal mediation and get a mediator from the National Mediation Board involved. Uh, and we will be doing that shortly, and there'll be more information coming out about that. Um, once the mediator is involved, they don't decide anything, but they set the timing and pace of negotiations and uh, down the road make important determinations such as whether we're released into a 30-day cooling off period if we get to that point. Um, so we can anticipate that um, the next uh, uh, coming months are, are going to be a very, uh, uh, things are going to heat up. Um, we are, you know, our slogan is we're ready. So we're ready to get an agreement. Um, and that means doing the picketing and wearing the lanyards and the pins and all that type of stuff that shows the company that we're serious about uh, getting an agreement. 
Um, and under the Railway Labor Act, there's a process for getting an agreement. Uh, if necessary, that uh, includes a uh, heightened pressure such as a strike vote and beyond. So that's what we can uh, expect. Um, you know, we've you know, we, we've said this before and, you know, just to kind of make it clear, um, we've got a plan to get an agreement that involves pressure on the company, heightened pressure on many areas and all flight attendants being involved. Uh, the plan does not include people taking matters into their own hands and doing items such as sick outs or refusing to pick up open time together and so forth. Um, those types of actions don't actually help our bargaining because uh, they just give the company leverage because they end up firing flight attendants and we got to fight to get their, uh, your jobs back or they, we may end up in court and we're tied up in that one. What we want to be doing is focused on, uh, you know, doing our actions to, you know, collectively pressure the company. So, um, you know, I, the, you know, sentiment to take the company on is good, but let's do it according to uh, a playbook and a plan uh, that actually works. Um, you know, a, a couple other particular questions that have come up I was asked to address. Um, one is, uh, you know, I, I, in terms of the economic proposal, we'll put that on the table and we're going to we're going to look at the industry. Um, you know, one of the factors we'll look at is that the, you know, Delta management in order to keep out the union um, because they're an anti union employer um, typically uh, gives increases to Delta flight attendants. And, you know, as far as we're concerned, that's a good thing. It's a result of an active uh, organizing campaign that AFA has uh, going on there. And, uh, you know, we're hoping we soon uh, Delta flight attendants will join all of us in our broad union family. So, so, um, but they've, given them increases recently, and they've also uh, given boarding pay. Um, so we'll be fighting for all of those, but we also need to understand that as an anti-union employer, they're more interested in optics than the reality of flight attendants' lives. And when you look at it, and we've done deep, deep dives, we've done it as uh, American bargaining here back when we did the joint contract, we've done it um, with the uh, United Continental merger where we did hundreds of variables with our economists and looked at, you know, how does, uh, you know, their work rules and all everything together um, stack up. And the reality is it's consistently shown that, you know, when you take everything together, uh, their contract, uh, their lack of a contract is a drag on the industry because their total amount that goes to flight attendants is uh, the least. And, uh, you know, our economist Dan actually had an interesting statistic that says that um, among the, you know, large, large and major carriers, uh, the share of the total compensation that goes to different employee groups, they have the lowest amount that goes to flight attendants. So that's one of the things that, you know, is kind of a factor in our negotiations, but it's just, um, you know, our, our position is we're union and we're strong. And what we're going to do is we're going to fight uh, for, you know, the, the highest pay we can get. Um, and But that's all that's all going to be a function of how much uh, pressure we put on the company. So there's also a question about, you know, how long negotiations going on and, you know, are we going to get back pay? And all of that stuff is items that are on the, on the table. There are proposals on the table and how much we get is how much we can uh, pressure and take on the company mm -hmm. and, and, uh, push them and 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 uh, you know beat them at the bargaining table and fundamentally uh, you know this is going to be crunch time so you know all flight attendants are going to be involved in this bargaining this is why we put out all the information we tell people what's going on um, we do that one because you have a right to know but we also do it is because you need to know what we're fighting for because we're all fighting for this together and the only way we're going to be able to, you know, take on American and get the contract that you all deserve is by, you know, everyone showing up on the picket line and taking the actions that we deserve. And uh, this is going to be an interesting six months. So I hope everyone talks to your flying partners about about getting involved and, and really, you know, joining this collective effort because, uh, you know, our slogan is we're ready and we're ready.
Sorry. That was a little Thanks, Joe. fired up. But. No, that's perfect. We're all fired up, right? We're all ready to get a contract. Um, that's where we're at, and we're working hard at the table. And we need our flight attendants out there definitely wearing their pins, wearing their lanyards. You'll have bag tags coming to you soon um, in the mail. So we really want to make sure all of our flight attendants are engaged, right? Engaged in knowing what's happening at the table and also showing the company that they're, they're ready. So um, thank you for that. There is one thing, Joe, that I think let's start. Let's talk about this because we did get a question about it. And it is, um, I think because the last contract was a merger contract, it wasn't a section six contract. Um, our, some of our flight attendants are, are under the impression that what happened in that contract as far as not being able to go on strike and going to arbitration, that that's the same as this negotiations. Can we just like really, we got to make sure that our flight attendants understand this is very different negotiations than the last one. No, it, it's fundamentally different. Look, it, it, it's been, uh, you know, this will be the first one, you know, for both U.S. Airways and America West. It, it'll be a couple decades before since we've had a full Section 6 bargaining where we're following the regular process. Um, but the the last uh, contract here, the merge contract, that was a function of the, the merger. And it had set up a separate process, which is not a process we typically use. And that ended in binding arbitration, which... You know, in general, that's not something that we do as part of the, the general process under Section 6. So there's a provision where it can be offered to the union and the company, you know, when you're getting a release, but we never take that because it takes it out of the hands of the members, right? You know, it, it gives it to a third party, which is an arbitrator, and arbitrators are not necessarily labor friendly. So we've got a process here that um, we have a... We have a process under the Railway Labor Act where we put increasing pressure on the company. Um, we have the full ability to take a strike vote. We can't strike or take any other form of economic action till we've been released to strike with the National Mediation Board, which is, you know, just to be honest, that's very difficult to get them to, to release us, but that's part of our overall struggle. So um, just because, uh, you know, that happened last time, that that's not the normal process. and. Um, we've got every tool that we have to put pressure on uh, the company to get an agreement and, and rest assured, uh, we're, we're going to do whatever it takes to get an agreement here. Thank you, Joe. That's it. All right, you got to go. I know, you got to come in. All right, thank you, Joe. All right, see you all. All right. So before we get started, um, one more thing I want to talk about is the timeline, um, because we have received a lot of questions of like, when are we going to get this done? We're ready for a contract. We're tired of this dragging on. Um, listen, this contract was opened up in November of 2018. Uh, it was negotiated in 2019, and then there was a long pause uh, during COVID. We stopped uh, early 2020, and we didn't start negotiations back up until 20, uh, August of 21. Every other airline out there in the industry, the pilot, the pilots, everybody pretty much did the same thing. Right now, we have so many other carriers that are in negotiations just like we are. Um, Southwest is in negotiations. They're, they're probably the closest to us as far as you know where they're at in the process. Um, United is out there bargaining. Alaska is out there bargaining. Um, the pilots, as we all know, our pilots are in negotiations also. Delta pilots, United pilots, it's, it appears right now almost everybody in the industry who is unionized is in negotiations. So where we're at in the process, we are not behind in the industry. We actually have passed every proposed, every section of our contract except for three, and those three will be passed in March. So I think um, I understand. We're really happy to see that you guys are all ready for a contract, that you're ready to pick it, and you're ready to show this company that you want a contract. But we just want to remind you of the timeline we're on and actually where we're at with the rest of the industry. So um, also, I wanted to address um, what we will be passing March 7th as far as our economic proposal. You can go to our website today and you can go to the negotiation status page and you can see there the opener for compensation, expenses, and also um, insurance, so uh, the section 26. And there we gave you bullet points of what we're basically focusing on. And then after we pass that proposal to the company in March, then we will update it with what we've passed. So if you wanna see what we're negotiating for, you can go there and you can see everything, along with everything that has been negotiated so far. 
So just a reminder on that. We're not going to take you there because we don't have time for that today because we have a lot of questions. So last week we met with the company and um, we passed the reserve proposal over. And what I want to say first about reserve is we are committed to bringing the reserve seniority down. We know this is a priority to our membership and we want you to know that we have heard you loud and clear and that we are committed to bringing that seniority down. Now, we will not be doing that by straight reserve. We've said that on previous town halls. We will be changing the reserve rotation and that will affect our new hires on the property after data signing. We are also definitely working to make this reserve system better than it already is. So we want to make sure that you understand that that is a priority for this negotiating team. Um, when we worked with the company last or passed this proposal last week, um, we had a lot of discussions around reserve. Um, as I said, I think that was our fourth uh, pass across the table. So we're going to update you with kind of where we're at with the reserve system right now with some of the items. One of them is, is we were trying to increase the number of aggressive hours to 60 because the way that it works today for our aggressive reserve hours is your first 40 hours, no matter how you obtained those hours through ROTA or a ROTA D assignment or a vacation or a jury duty, it goes towards the 40 hours of aggressive. Um, the company was not interested, we could see in, the, in increasing that to 60. So we changed our proposal to, we want 40 aggressive hours of only when you're bidding for aggressive trips and awarded those trips. So that would mean that if you're bidding on ROTA or you're bidding in, or you're receiving assignment in ROTA D or your vacation hours or your jury duty hours, those would not count to the 40 aggressive hours. So we passed that last week. We changed the proposal. We wanted to let you know that. Uh, next up, we're going to have Susan talk about where we're at with the flex days, Susan. Um, we know your days off are very important. We do have a new uh, agreed in 12 ton. There's new language that says when you're flown into a flex day or a golden day and you can't get mutual agreement on where to place that day with cruise schedule, the day will automatically be placed at the end of that um, that current block, which I think helps you keep that block intact, even though it's just moving one day. Um, we are still talking with the company about a uh, language that would increase your flexibility uh, bidding in Rota when you want to bid and fly into a flex day versus the company assigning into flex days. So we're Working on that, the company understands protecting your days off as a priority for us, um, and we're still uh, committed to working for better language on that. Okay, and we're also trying to limit um, the number of flex days that you can be used, right? And we've we've been working on that for this entire time. We've seen a little movement on this, which is good. Um, we'll have more hopefully to share with you after our next session, um, but we do see some movement on limiting the number of flex days that you can um, be used into. Yeah. All right, thanks Susan. Uh, next up, let's talk about those wraps and uh, four versus three wraps. Reese? All right, um, so we have proposed uh, three wraps. Today the contract uh, allows the company to put up to four wraps and we see four wraps in almost every base but we've received a lot of feedback that RAP D is unpopular because reserves are assigned early morning flights after being on call all night. Um, sequences that actually could have gone to a RAP A because they're reporting over an overlapping time period. Um, and so we see it as a quality of life issue because we've heard so much from our members about how um, unpopular RAP D is. And so we wondered what would happen if we switched to three wraps and all of those that are in wrap D today would now be placed into wrap A the following day. They'd still be legal for that same trip. They'd still get the same trip assigned, but instead of starting their wrap the night before, they would start it at the wrap A time, which is typically very early in the morning. So um, we looked up, we ran a lot of uh, data. We've formulated a report that we put together and what we found is that our hypothesis was kind of correct. Um, there is a large gap 
during the RAPD time in which sequences are not assigned to anyone. And then it picks up again the following morning. Um, a lot of times during that period when RAPD has already begun, but because contractually RAPD has to be used before RAP A can be used, those sequences are going to RAP D. And then um, that also results in RAP D being assigned in those two hours following um, the end of their uh, RAP, their reporting after their RAP has ended as well. And all of that could have just been going to RAP A. And the company has um, an issue in covering trips during RAP A because that's when most of our trips are. Um, going out, is it early mornings or afternoon departures? And so it would make sense to have more reserves in that RAP A um, grouping. And so we presented this report to the company. We just did that at our last session. We spent um, a long time explaining to them what our uh, findings were, and they asked a lot of really important questions. So we haven't received their response yet, but we're hopeful that we were able to make some headway in explaining why RAP three or three wraps is so important um, to the membership and why it's been part of our proposal this whole time. Thanks, Reese. I think uh, Legacy US had three wraps mm -hmm. and with this system, right? With the same reserve rules, everything um, before. Uh, so we do, we have a little comparison also. We know kind of how it worked back then mm -hmm. and how it's working today. I think. What we've heard from a lot of our flight attendants who ha are on RAP D is they're prepared to go out that night. It's really that 4 or 5 a.m. Uh, report that they're ending up getting that they it's just I think you hit the nail on the head with the quality of, of life, right? We want to improve our reserves quality of life while they're working and we really need to um, be focusing on that and the company needs to get to. Exactly. Thank you. All right, um, Wendy, let's talk about uh, reserves dropping trips in ETB. OK, um, something that we do uh, have today in the contract is reserves. Um, they can drop their reserve trips in ETV and the company had proposed that uh, they didn't want you to uh, be able to do that. So we were not accepting that language and they did back off of that. And what they did put in there, though, was a proposal saying if you do drop your reserve trips, and you end the month with less than 40 hours in your guarantee then or 40 hours of reserve time that you would not earn sick vacation or credit for the reserve month. Uh, we pass this back to them and are not accepting that language. Thanks, Wendy. Sure. I, I, I think that kind of gives me, um, I'm just thinking about, you know, basically what we're doing now is telling you exactly what's happening at the table. Right, because you just said this is what the company proposed. You know, we want to make sure everybody understands um, this is all what you're seeing, right? When we put out our hotlines and they say reject, 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 and what the company proposes something like this. This is a normal part of negotiations. This is how it always has worked. What you're seeing today is you've never had this opportunity before to, for us to tell you in a sense, play by play of what's happening. So we're kind of pulling the curtain back on it and showing you the process. So I know, um, you know, we definitely get a lot of feedback. The company's not, you know, agreeing to anything. Um, this is part of the process. This is what we do. This is go back and forth. We sometimes some proposals, we're going to pass back and forth with the company 10, 12 times easily. Um, and we're every time you're passing, you're trying to adjust a little bit, or you're trying to figure out, okay, let, let's listen to what their concern is, let's listen to what our concern is, and try and get to that end state where we can both agree on something. Because we own what's in the contract today. We own it, the com company owns it. Um, but we just, you know, the process of how we get to a new agreement is what we're showing you now. So we just wanted to make sure you guys understood um, that, this is all part of the normal negotiations process. All right, Brian, let's talk a little bit about out of base. Um, uh, flight attendants being able to pick up trips through TTS UBL out of, out of base. Correct. Um, this is a big item that we hear a lot about from our members, and it's an item that we have been uh, proposing to the company. Uh, last week's conversation with the company uh, was a very good one. Um, I think that we were able to Get across to the company how we wanted the uh, proposal to work um, for our members within that respective base, especially those reserves. 
um, that are in the, um, their base uh, assignments. Um, and uh, at, I think uh, um, that conversation was uh, enabled the company to understand it better uh, as we move forward in the proposals and they'll, they'll continue forward. Um, we will expect to hear from them um, on their next pass. Um, like I said, I think it was a positive conversation and one that uh, I think we can build from. Thank you, Brian. OK, we have been talking um, a lot about electronic notification. Um, it is 2023. Um, our contract pretty much is built on um, a lot of phone calls, right? And as we've heard from many of you, you don't want to really sit and wait on hold um, with crew scheduling, crew tracking, hotel limo, right? You don't want to be waiting forever. Um, but there are some parts of our contract that need to be positive contact still. So Kelly's going to talk a little bit today about where we're at with electronic notification. Well, if you've had a chance to check out the website, you will see that we have already have some agreements on some electronic notifications, such as the enhanced VE that we um, were able to secure that has an electronic notification piece. If you want to do a deadhead flex on the front or back end of your sequence, we have an electronic notification piece in there. Um, the team went through and we comprehensively went through the contract from, you know, from the beginning to the end to figure out every single thing that has any type of contact with the company in it, such as calling in sick, reserve calling out of time, all those types of things. And we went through and we classified which ones, you know, we were amenable to electronic contact and which ones we were not. So what that electronic contact looks like, we've kind of broken it into three different pieces. Um, we Look, is it something that can just be a push notification? Is it something that's a push notification that would have a response like a two way contact, like maybe texting back and forth? And also something with a receipt piece, which um, we're looking at, you know, you actually have a record of I did this, they agreed to this, boom, I have it. And for that to have like some type of log where you can access it, so you're not having to burn your phone with 20 million screenshots. Um, you know, in the revolving door to go see your flight service manager and stuff. So we're not exactly sure what that's going to look like at the end of the day, but um, it will be an enhancement for us. So as Julie said, we wouldn't be on the phone for hours trying to get through to just get a hotel or transportation, any of those types of things. But we are not going to agree to something that does not have a receipt, right? We're not going to, because what we have seen with some of our systems already currently where you acknowledge and you've acknowledged, but they haven't received the acknowledgement, right? And then they're either calling you in the middle of the night to say, hey, Kelly, you know, um, we're not, what are you going to show up for your trip tomorrow? Um, so we definitely, in order for us to agree to electronic not notification, we have to have a receipt system. So the flight attendant knows you have received, the company has received that acknowledgement or whatever it is, right? And then a record of it. it, it that's, that's a, it, it's a no-go if it doesn't, if we don't have that. Okay, thanks, Kelly. All right, next up, Tim, lots of questions about this new Skyview 6, I believe it is, the, Dallas, the new hotel over here at uh, headquarters. And especially from our flight attendants who are, uh, commuters now to Dallas. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. For years, uh, Dallas commuters have been asking for hotel accommodations when they attend CQ and other required equipment training. Uh, we're very pleased to announce that the company did agree to provide accommodations for those DFW commuters who reside more than 50 miles away from the training location. Um, so that's very good news. Of course, this is dependent on a successful TA being passed. But um, we're very happy that they did agree to that. Okay, thanks, Tim. So that will happen once we get a TA passed, right? And uh, we'll get our commuters into that hotel. All right, Tim, stay on because I've got a question for you right off the bat here. We're going to go to the questions from our flight attendants now. And our first question is, are the unproductive credit hours per duty period being addressed in the final negotiations? It seems that unless it is IPD or high credit value terms, just about every trip out of Miami averages five hours or less. We also seem to be getting more and more three days, which credit at 10 to 12 hours. 
This creates a mandatory 17 uh, eight to 18 day work month in PBS for most who are forced into 80 plus hour lines. So yes, yeah, so we are looking at some improvements which would help sequence construction. Uh, it is a priority though for the team to maintain a good variety of flying for our flight attendants as we know that flight attendants have many different interests when it comes to their flying. Um, not everybody likes four days, not everybody likes turns, etc. Not everybody likes high time two days. So preserving a, a variety of flying is very important to us. With any change, um, there comes unintended consequences. So we are looking at improving trip rigs, uh, the duty day rig. We're looking at a minimum calendar day rig, similar to what the pilots have. They have a 515 minimum per calendar day, which sounds great. It's great for IPD, right? You have a four day IPD trip, which is worth like 16 and a half in Miami. That would now pay 21. It is currently paying 21 for the pilots. And on an IPD trip, they can't add any more flying, right? The downside is on a say a domestic trip or an IPD trip, uh, they can add more flying. So the company isn't just going to start paying 21 hours for a four day trip and keep all the other parameters the same, right? They're gonna try to fill up that, that flying. Um, a good example of this is the three day all nighter trips that the pilots had, which paid like 12 and a half. So now those are paying 1545. So what the company did is they added more flying to those trips. So the pilots saw an increase of four day trips um, so they did have to make some modifications. So it is something we're cognizant about and we are going to be um, very careful about, you know, any changes that we propose and how that's going to change the bid sheet ultimately. We're also looking at a sit time rig, which would kick in after two hours of being having sit time that would pay on top of the value of the sequence. We've heard loud and clear that people don't like these long sits. Um, eliminating sits together is, is pretty much unlikely to happen, but at least if they're going to have them, it should, you know, provide the flight and some additional compensation. And it's also a deterrent to build these sequences in that manner. Thank you, Tim. OK, next question. Are there any plans to negotiate us being paid for training and for travel to training, perhaps a minimum of five hours a day for each day of training? This might encourage the company to be more meaningful with how they use the time we're there. Also, will there be hotels provided? OK, we've already answered that one. Uh, so let, Wendy, let's go back up here to our training and what we're, what we're going to be doing. So yes, uh, training will be uh, part of the economics package, and we're working on that right now with our uh, economics economist, uh, Dan Akins. Uh, so uh, as soon as we get that out, it will be posted to the website, and we are seeking to improve that training pay for sure. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, next question. An LOA needs to happen if a priority return in Los Angeles isn't moving. How can the company and union allow mutual transfer and no backfills? This is a violation of my POR. If LAX is truly overstaffed, then there should absolutely be no movement into the base regardless. Okay, um, currently the contract gives flight attendants two uh, ways to get into a base. One is through vacancy transfers, and one is through mutual transfers. Uh, the vacancy transfers is first priority of returns, right? And then seniority. And then the mutuals is purely by seniority. That is our current contract that we have today. So um, as far as a violation of our contract today, that is not happening. The mutuals are happening. There's there's not been, that's a trading of one flight attendant for another, one who's leaving and one's coming in. Right, um, and the when they don't backfill, um, that is uh, because they are not. That's not through a mutual process, right? That's that's the vacancy process. So I just wanted to clarify that that is definitely not a violation of the contract today that we have, where mutual transfers are allowing one flight attendant to go out of the base and one flight attendant to come into the base. Okay. Okay. Next up. Are any of the negotiating team members a qualified language speaker? How would you feel about not being heard? How would you feel about being ignored as a speaker during contract negotiations? Um, Susan, do you want to take that? And then I'll add in a little if you want. <laughs> um, sure. No, there is not a qualified speaker on the current negotiating team. There was one uh, when the team was initially formed 
in 2018. As you all know, we are a membership of 25,000 flight attendants, and I'm happy to see we are more diverse than ever, and we're a team of six. Um, and so there's no way every specific group of flight attendants could have a representative on this team. And it's a challenge for us, but I think we're doing a very good job of hearing all of our 25,000 members and getting the best contract for everyone, because at the end of it, we're all flight attendants first. And I think we're a, our, our team is a good representative of all seniorities um, and different experiences and those strengths, different strengths that we bring um, helps us uh, recognize and represent 25,000 members of all seniorities and all different interests. Thank you, Susan. And I definitely think we have heard from a lot of our speakers and we are well aware of the, the position um, on Section 15. And we have had discussions with them as far as where we're at in the process today. Today, our focus is reserve and scheduling and getting through these two very big sections of our contract. And then after that, we will be going on um, back to some areas of, of concern. So um, thank you for sending that in, but we definitely have heard from many speakers and we are listening. All right. Uh, well, I like this question. Can we expect a new contract before the end of the year? We are ready. Yes, we are. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, we, where we're at, we're at a really critical phase right now. We're ready to pass the economics in March. Um, as Joe mentioned earlier, how this process is going to go in the next six months, right? There's going to be a lot happening. We are definitely, this team is very hopeful that we will have a tentative agreement out to the membership to vote on uh, prior to the end of this year. All right. Next question. Can we put a provision in this contract to start negotiations a minimum of two years prior to the expiration date? We have been without a new contract for how long now? I addressed that earlier in the timeline. Um, listen, uh, us in the entire industry, is it, uh, we all are feeling the same way. We all want a contract. It's been way too long since all of us have had um, wage increases. Uh, and as far as putting a two year um, prior to the opening, uh, early opener, this contract had a one year early opener and it did um, get opened early. Uh, but, it, you know, obviously in this industry, there are a lot of things that happen that sometimes we don't plan for. So um, we'll take that into consideration. We don't have the, um, the number of years this contract will be good for yet. And so um, probably when we get to that point, that's when we'll address that. All right. Could we please have more than seven layers on PBS for specific bidders? We need more layers. Different aircraft and same positions can put you in a different class. Reese, you want to take that one on? Yes. Um, so initially, if you've been following our um, proposals back and forth with the company on the website, we did propose an eighth layer in PBS, um, but we also proposed improvements to the chart itself in 10D to add additional properties that you don't see in PBS today. One of those properties was specific position bidding by aircraft. And the company did agree to that property addition into the chart. And so we have, um, we're most likely going to withdraw our uh, proposal for an eighth layer because the um, reason that so many people had reached out that they needed additional layers was because of this exact issue that you mentioned in your question. And as part of what um, Nate helped American agree with us to add this additional property, as well as a few others, and you can read up on those on the website, is that they have agreed to program and test, but they're concerned that adding um, additional properties will increase the runtime, which was also why they were hesitant to um, add in any additional layers, even an eighth layer, even one more layer could have significantly increased the runtime and contractually our runtime. So PBS closes on the 15th and you get your award on the 18th. And I'm sure no one here wants that to go any longer because we like having our schedule as soon as we can get it. Um, and so adding additional things does 
um, bog down the system, does bog down PBS, and then increase the runtime. So AA has agreed to program and test the different things, but um, they have also stated that if it does increase the runtime and they're not able to meet the contractual obligations of that 18th um, award, then they'll meet with us, APFA, to discuss if the timeline needs to be adjusted and APFA and American will come to a decision on what to do at that time. But for now, um, they have agreed to program and test the specific position bidding by aircraft. I think that will help quite a bit. Yes. Um, and hopefully it will help with not needing more layers. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're pretty confident um, that this can happen. Uh, Based on all the all of that we've been through in the last five, six, seven years, as far as the programming of PBS, um, and so I, I think uh, this is something that it will really help our flight attendants with their bidding. All right, thanks, Reese. Uh, next up, okay. I'm. This is a really long question, and instead of reading the question, um, because it's so long, it really is about what are we doing about cartels. How's that? Because <laughs> um, the question is going to take about three minutes for me to read. So, Brian, do you want to just talk about kind of uh, where we're at with that? Um, both uh, APFA and the company um, have uh, presented uh, language back and forth regarding the circumstances. Um, we are still working on scheduling. It's a, it's a, um, a, uh, a section that's still open. Proposals are being passed back and forth, and both parties are actively working um, on trying to uh, insert language that would rectify um, or curtail some of the cartel uh, concerns and issues that our membership has. Um, and um, as you can see um, on our uh, negotiation page, um, as we update it, you'll be able to see some of those uh, proposals that we're making on both sides. Um, and as again, the, the section is still open. Um, we don't have anything concrete um, uh, overall. Um, there have been a few agreed items um, at this point um, in concept. Um, but we are working to to rectify the situation. And, it, and it, like I said, it is an ongoing discussion. And so we, we've heard from the members. We know that this is an issue. It is a difficult issue to solve also um, because we don't want to limit flexibility, right? Correct. Flexibility is really important to our workforce. We are, we're trying to increase flexibility, but we also know that what's happening at some bases, um, at a lot of our bases, um, we need we need something in the contract to address it. So it's a priority to us. We encourage you, and um, we are working on uh, getting something in the contract that helps um, to, to address this issue. All right, uh, let's see. OK, next question. This is nice. Good morning, and thank you for working for our membership. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, in light of the fact that we've had not a, uh, we have not had a pay raise in years, is it in the cards, in your opinion, seeing Delta just landed at $76? Our in their tentative agreement, in their tentative contract, and United's top pay scale tentative agreement is $100 per hour. Where will APFA membership ballpark be? There's more, but it's all related to the same thing. So let me address first. Joe's already addressed Delta and really um, why Delta, how this works with Delta, right? When somebody comes into unionized Delta, they get pay increases. But really, the back of the book for Delta is much different than the back of our book, right? And what's in there. But let's talk. I want, I'm glad you asked this question because I want to talk about what people think United is proposing. To date, United does not have a proposal that I'm aware of with what they're going to propose for their pay um, raises um, in their contract. What is circulating is actually, it's called their white flag pay or purple flag pay, and that is like our red flag pay, um, which is uh, 150%. Our 150% is 102.38. We just don't have it in the contract like they have it in the contract. But that is the chart that is circulating out there that United is proposing. I don't know what United is going to propose, um, but I can tell you we are making sure that our proposal um, is what we believe that our members deserve 
um, that we know that um, we have all worked very hard over the last few years. And we also know that inflation has gone through the roof since we've all received a raise. So just kind of wanted to clear that up. Thank you for asking the question um, because we hear that all the time. Um, first off, are we going to get what Delta has? And then second, United's proposing 100, and I think over 100, right, is theirs, yeah. So hope that answers your question. Um, as of probably March 9th or somewhere in that vicinity, you will see the exact proposal of what we are passing at the table. All right, let's see here. And I think, Wendy, I think I just covered that, right? Pretty much on this one. So we'll skip over that. Okay. Okay, this one says, I hope my emails have been seen, but in case, are we fighting for flight pay at aircraft swipe on an end of the day? Um, and it may cut down on the obnoxious sit times. Well, we kind of talked about what we're proposing, but go ahead, Reese. Sure, yeah. This. Um, also, your emails probably have been seen. We do our best to answer them, but I'm sure as you've heard during this session, um, we are meeting with the company regularly and after each session with the company, we then have to come back, do research, pull data, write reports, updates. So we try to answer emails as efficiently as we can. So I apologize if you haven't gotten a response yet, but we're doing our best. Um, as far as flight pay from aircraft swipe on to the end of the day, um, Tim covered this a little bit, but we're paid different rates depending on what part of the day we're in. If you're on, if you're not on board an airplane, you're just getting paid your duty rig. If you're working a flight with passengers, you're getting your flight pay and you ultimately end up getting paid whatever is the highest um, based on the flight time, the duty rig, the trip rig, or the minimum duty period rig. So um, we are focused on improving each of those so that flight attendants will can get the highest pay. And um, as Tim addressed, we're trying to improve the rigs themselves. So it's possible that the same trip you're working today will be will pay more in the future, but it's also possible that the same trip you're working today is going to pay more in the future, and therefore the company is going to add more sequence uh, flying to it, and so it won't be the same trip any longer. Um, so we're keeping that in mind as we propose these different things, and um, as far as the obnoxious sit times, we are proposing a sit time break. Um, the rig itself is uh, going to kick in at two hours past um, a sit and a sit time. So once you get to two hours and one minute is when the sit time rig would kick in. And it's a one minute of pay for every two minutes past that two hour mark. So a two and a half hour sit would pay 15 minutes and this would be pay no credit. Thanks and I believe that's the same as what the pilots have today at American. Okay. All right, it looks like we have a lot of questions that are about what we're proposing for pay okay so um so i'm not going to read all of your questions so i don't want to get offended that i'm not reading your exact question um but we when it comes to the economics joe talked about that a little bit at the beginning um and then um once we pass our proposal to the company we will um, you will see that on our website so let's get to some of these other questions um kelly i believe you're going to help me with this one is there a push to eliminate the hard 40 or to modify the hard 40 to a yearly hourly quota? I think the elimination of the hard 40 or modifying it to an annual hourly quota, such as 480 hours flown annually to maintain sick and vacation, would significantly improve flight attendants' flexibility with respect to their schedule. So we're not looking to eliminate the hard 40, but what we are looking at is for in PDS that the 40 floor would still maintain in that. But once you exit PDS, you would have the ability to go down to 30 exercising any of the other systems such as TTS, UBO or ETB. And pretty much that's based off of our survey. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. All right, um, many of us were on EVOAs when the last VAP was were offered and never got a chance to take it when our leaves were canceled. Could APFA please negotiate 
for the company to reoffer the same VIA that was offered during the pandemic again. If all the same benefits were offered, I would take it. <laughs> okay, Susan, do you want to take that one? So we are not negotiating for a VIA in this contract, but we are looking for improvements to, say, cashing out your sick bank, um, moving, which pays at $8,000, right? Yeah. Moving that money into a, um, a HRA account so that you'd have uh, a, a savings account going into retirement or looking at increases in the 401k contribution and match that would help someone going into retirement. So while there's not a specific VIA plan negotiated, we are looking for improvements for those who want to retire. Thanks, Susan. Okay. All right, Kelly, I've got another one for you here. Every time we get an increase in pay, our insurance our insurance premiums go up. This is not a raise. Can we work on lowering our insurance costs also? So yeah, so currently what the contract provides for is that our workforce would be paying 21% of the aggregate um, for the standard plan. So what the heck does that mean? So I had to look up aggregates too. So pretty much whatever the cost structure is for that, for that, uh, for the standard plan, that you would only be responsible for 21% of it. Well, I mean, we're all stuck in inflation right now and it's killing us. So we are exploring some type of cap, whether it be part of that aggregate or if it's going to be in each year when they rerun the numbers that there would be a cap that we would not be forced to pay more than X amount than what it was the previous year. So yes, we are exploring some type of throttling on that to, to help keep more money in our pocket. And pretty much where we're at as far as insurance, this is company-wide as far as all the unions on the property, right? Yes. We are pretty much all in the same Every single unionized workforce on property has that 21% aggregate and pretty much has the exact same chart that you see in section in 26. Yeah. So that's the pilots, the agents, the res agents, mechanics, the mechanics fleet. We're all in the same. This patch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Kelly. All right, Reese. Please address TTS limitations for trading, even on same day. Must first drop, then pick up, which is highly restrictive with cap days and 48 hour limitation. This must be changed. Actually, no trading swapping involved in the process. Okay, so to clarify, um, TTS does process neutral trades. Um, it is not a drop, then pick up. If you are trading the same number of days over the same date range, that is in TTS, that is a trade and it will be processed. The confusion comes in UBL because in UBL, which is the day before and the day of um, this exact transaction, the neutral transact trade trade is not possible in UPL. In UBL, you must first drop your trip into open time and then you can pick up a different trip because you no longer have that trip. And as we all know, open time is almost always at 3%, so it's nearly impossible to just straight drop something into open time. So what we are looking at is um, to allow neutral trades to happen in UBL up to rota processing the day before. So um, a, uh, Americans' concern is that um, even though it's a neutral trade, you know, you're the same date range and the same number of days on the trip, the report times are going to be different. And the company um, allocates reserves in different wraps based on the report times of their expectations of open time and what they have in open time. And if at the last minute everybody's sw swapping around, um, their reserve numbers are going to be off. And so we have proposed that the neutral trading in UBL would only be up until ROTA processing. And so that way they can determine where the report times are early enough to allocate reserves to the correct routes. 
Okay, thanks, Ben. I'm I'm sorry if I missed it, but did you talk about the TTS exception that we're working on? It's not as the same. We don't have to get into a lot of detail on it, but I think what our flight attendants need to know is we're continuing to work on an exception to that three percent mm -hmm. um, because what we recognize is is that if we just increase it to five percent, right, more trips will drop into open time. And really what we're hearing from our flight attendants is they want the ability to trade more with what's in open time, not necessarily just drop trips into open time. So we are working on an exception to that. Um, of course, there's a few rules to it all as far as to when it would happen. Um, so we're kind of working through that process right now. Um, the pilots have implemented uh, something very similar to what's being proposed and we're reviewing with the pilots, you know, the success of that over there um, before we agree to anything. So um, we realize this is a really also important part of the contract for all of our members. They want to see more flexibility and we definitely, I know for myself, if I see a better trip in there for tomorrow and I'm on one I don't really like, um, I of course want to trade for that better trip or different, even a different time. And it might not be a better trip, but maybe the sign in is a little better for me or the time it gets back is a little better. So um, it just would really help our flight attendants to have that flexibility. So we're going to continue to push for that. All right, let's see here. This is another long question. I'm trying to get through all of it here to see. Kelly, this is uh, you and I. Let's see. Recently, I decided to do a double up with a red eye. Oh, OK, I've got the gist of it. However, I didn't realize that because I chose the double up, it automatically made my duty day 15 hours right? Uh, 15 hour max. Is there any discussion to change that rule to still follow original sign in and cap it at, because this was at night, a 13 hour or almost four, or a 14 hour duty day? Um, we are not looking to change that language at all. Um, the folks who do double, up, double ups live and die by them and yeah. love them. Um, so when you are trying to do a double up within the systems, um, you have to tell the system that, hey, I want to double up. So that's kind of the protection throttle that we have on it. Um, but we are not looking to change that in any way. Yeah, I think it would really decrease the amount of double ups that we could do, yeah. right? That our flight attendants could do if we did do that. So yeah, and we actually, in PDS, we one of the properties that we proposed and the company agreed to is where you could actually conduct a generic double up within PDS. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Kelly. OK, uh, since this negotiation process could take a long time, I hope not much longer. That's me, not this flight attendant. <laughs> Will the union and the company start implementing some of the win-win agreed upon items with side letters, or will that just derail the process? We will not be doing any side letters um, while, we are, where, while we are where we are at in the negotiation process, OK, um, because at this point, this is all part of negotiations. We have to wait until we get this complete package done, right? What, what we can do, what the company is doing too, is what we are negotiating. They can also be working behind the scenes with IT, with other areas to get ready for if this contract is, when this contract is approved, um, to be ready to start working on those implemented items as soon as possible, okay? Um, so, we do know that is being done. You know, anything that we are discussing at the table, we have an IT person there with us also. Um, we know that it has to go through a process to make sure that what we're negotiating for can be implemented. And as Reese talked about in one of her earlier answers about the process here, um, sometimes when we negotiate something, it, you don't know it until it's actually done that it's going to, like in the case of what Reese was talking about, increase the runtime of PBS or increase the runtime of TTS or something like that. So those are part of the those discussions are part of the negotiation process, but the actual implementation of these items will not happen until after uh, tentative agreement is approved. All right, let's see, we've got time for just a couple more. I think I already answered that one. OK, Susan, I've got one for you. What are you doing to uh, for increasing galley pay? Galleys? Uh, I think they mean work their butt off. And so far, more than a speaker, 
who it has to speak. Galley should make at least $5 an hour or more or at least as much as a speaker. A lot of people want and flying it won't fly it because of how much work it entails. Sorry, this one was worded a little differently. Okay, galley pay. Susan, what are we doing about galley pay? We are proposing an increase to galley pay. We know the galleys work hard, especially with our reduced staffing. Um, we also have proposed an increase in speaker pay. So uh, we're working on the chart that you see in the contract that talks about lead and purser and galley. The chart's a little messy, so we're also working to clean up that chart. Uh, and we're also, we hear a lot of comments about the uh, 321T 20 seat aircraft. We're looking for an increase in pay in that one. The number one works on their own up there. So you will see um, hopefully improvements in that in that chart and the pay. Thanks. Okay, uh, what's going on? Getting our additional staffing back. Oh, okay. Well, we have filed a grievance. Um, staffing grievances are very um, time consuming and complicated to say the least. Um, but we also are proposing, we have proposed and we passed it across the table to bring our staffing back to what it was prior to COVID. So that is part of our negotiations. Of course, at this point, um, the company has not agreed to returning the staffing um, to what it was pre COVID. But we still have that on the table. Okay. Why are you not enforcing our schedule to be given to the flight attendants on the 15th of the month? I understand during the difficulty of COVID scheduling it was necessary, but we are on normal operations again. Um, the 15th of the month is when PBS actually closes. It takes um, at least uh, 48 hours to process PBS, all of the um, bids. And so per the contract, it is uh, the 15th is just the date that PBS closes. It is not the date for flight attendants to see their schedules. And you are seeing your schedules um, per what the contract states as far as the timeline is concerned on the 18th. Um, but there is um, no way for you to know what your schedule is on the 15th. This process is so different than line bidding. Um, and and actually, I will say sometimes um, I'm not going to say sometimes you would not want those schedules on the 15th because this is not a process you want to rush um, the 48 hours. There is a lot of work done by the union along with the company to make sure the schedules that are going out to our flight attendants are the best schedules that we can get them um, based on the bids. And that does take um, a lot of that takes time. So um, we will not see a change in you know, you getting your bids ever, you know, the same day or the day after they close. OK, we've got time for just a couple more. Um, OK, let's see here. Why does our pay scale end at 13 years? Brian. Um, well, you get paid sooner. Um, you hit your um, highest uh, level at that point. Um, in an old LAA uh, contract at one point, it was 15 years. And in an old LUS contract, I believe we were at 14. So 13, um, you've actually gained um, in the circumstances of getting paid faster and reaching the top payout. Um, um, the benefit would be even to go less if we could to get to the, that maximum top payout uh, sooner than, than later. So um, right now, 13 years is pretty much industry wide um, in regards to uh, all the majors and where we, we all hit our max out pay. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. OK, oops, lost the questions. Hang on one second here. And just a couple more here. Um, oh, Brian, you can answer this one too. Why isn't the jump seat exempt from a weight restriction? Other airlines do have that exemption. Um, the second half of your question is absolutely correct. United and Delta do have the uh, um, exemption under weight restriction. Um, under the uh, LUS contract, we also had that. That was changed um, prior to the merger um, at LUS and into um, this contract. Um, we are working diligently um, through this proposal to get that reversed um, in uh, uh, Section 37, which is currently tabled. Um, and it is an item that we are very adamant about um, reversing because we would meet industry standard. OK, and this is really terrible, but I'm asking the questions that are the shortest right now so we can get as many in as possible. Will all vacation days be paid at five hours, no matter how many days in a row? Reese? Short answer? Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> 
Yes, this was um, proposed in April with Section 8. It's currently tabled, um, but you can review it online. But yes, we propose all vacation days paid at five hours, no matter if, the, if you have six days, 10 days, 12 days, whatever length of your vacation time, it would all pay five hours per day. Okay, we proposed it, yes. but it has not been agreed to Correct. yet. Yes. Just to clarify, yes. I want to make sure everybody understands that. Because um, if it was already agreed to, we'd be jumping up and down for joy. <laughs> um, okay, but that looks like we've already answered it. Um, okay, and a lot of the pay questions. And I think I'm just going to end with kind of where I started as far as reserve. Another question about why are we being elusive about reserve? And it's not that we're being elusive about reserve. Um, we've talked about reserve quite a bit. We have many um, different thoughts amongst all of our 25,000 about what reserve should be. Um, and we have a lot of history right on uh, also added in to those thoughts. So I want you to know that we're really committed to bring this reserve seniority down. It is a top priority for us. OK, I don't we're not being elusive, but we are taking our time on this. We know that this is a really important um, part of our contract for all of our members, and we know that there are many different views on what it should be, but really before we propose something, we want to make sure it's right. We want to make sure that it will bring the seniority down um, at our bases. And so um, we are we are definitely going to share that with you um, when we have that uh, finalized, um, but we are not there yet. Um, it will not be straight reserve, as I said earlier, um, and it will involve changing the rotation for new hires that come on after the date of signing, and it definitely will be a better reserve system for those who are working reserve. So just want to reiterate that to all of you. Um, it's very important to us. We know it's very important to all of you, um, and um, we hear you. So with that, um, we will end today and um, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you find these beneficial. They are on our website. I think we have three on there currently from the past and um, we will continue to be as transparent as we possibly can with you and share that economic proposal as soon as we've passed it across the table to the company first. So thank you again. Um, please stay engaged. Please wear your union pins every time you go to work, wear your red lanyards, and then look for um, in the mail two uh, bag tags that will be coming to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, thank you. Thank you.